Welcome at day two of the EuroK 2021 symposium. We had already a good day yesterday, a good start into uh, our symposium. Today, I'm even more, ex no, I'm not more ex excited, I'm equally excited about this panel, uh, the visionary talk, where we will look a little bit into sustainability, a little bit in the direction, what are we doing, we are, how get, are we getting out of this crisis, and a, a special look into the environmental issue, targets uh, we are having, uh, Henry Kololai made already a couple of comments to that. So that will lead us then into panel three immediately after this visionary talk, and they will then uh, discuss more the technical solutions. Uh, just a quick reminder, all the bios of our speakers are available on the EuroK website or on the streaming page you are currently on. Secondly, uh, there is a pre-recorded message of all our speakers of the visionary panel. Please, those are really 20 well-invested uh, minutes because uh, the speeches are great and the messages are really meaningful and uh, uh, a lot of content. So uh, I know that many of you watched it already. Uh, so I will not ask the speakers again for an introduction statement. So we directly go into it. Please also be aware of uh, the Slido, the question uh, tool we are having uh, directly on the page you are currently on. So there will, be, uh, there will be the possibility to raise questions and we are counting a lot on you uh, to raise questions. This visionary talk is especially tailored uh, for questions from the audience. Secondly, there will be a poll. So there will be two questions I'm asking you to rank the order, the importance, to give the panel a little bit an insight of uh, how we think, how the audience think, uh, where the priorities are. With this, I directly want to go and welcome my panel, Steve Grima. Very good to see you, Steve, uh, Director, Air Navigation Bureau uh, at ICAO. Philip Cornelis, Director of Aviation, DG Move at the European Commission. Hi, Philip. Luke Dutgert, uh, he is uh, Strategy and Safety Management Director at EASA. And from IATA, Raphael Schwarzmann. Uh, he's the regional director here, uh, and very good to have you, Rafael. So we have heard your opening statements, and Steve, if you allow me to start with you. You, may, you said in your opening statement, we have to be creative, we have to find the right balance, and you're counting a lot on innovation. You are diplomatically very correct with this statement. That's what we always tried on a global level. But is this enough to do to find the right balance, or do we have regionally different uh, in 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 the goals we are setting here? Or is it? I mean, uh, we all all those pre-recorded messages had one item on, so we have to address the environmental issue. Is a balanced approach? and the innovation good enough to address that, Steve? Well, uh, good afternoon, Christian, and good afternoon to your audience at EuroK. It's a real pleasure to uh, be able to join you here uh, from sunny Montreal and to have a chance to share with you uh, some provocative views, I think, that would be uh, based upon events on the world stage in just the last week, week and a half. When I recorded my message, I was thinking about Europe and the preeminence of the European environmental message and the environmental direction. And of course, we heard some of that from uh, Philippe in his message. But I'm actually very pleased to see that we're now off to the races and that we have different parts of the world defining uh, very ambitious environmental goals and that those environmental goals essentially will require breathtaking change in aviation over the course of the next uh, 10 to 20 years. If I look back to when ICAO was established in 1944, take the 20 years from 1944 to 1964, and we moved from a world war to the jet age. That required an extraordinary amount of innovation, cooperation, risk taking, and risk management. We didn't call it risk management, in the 50s and the 60s. But that's exactly what we were learning and forming as we uh, developed the commercial aviation industry and, and truly brought international transportation into the forefront of global development. And I believe 
that we are about to embark on uh, what the United States uh, president called a moonshot for this generation to move aviation from trying to create efficiencies for profit to aviation creating efficiencies for global sustainability that may well cost the society a little bit more to make, but will achieve many of the objectives that require the collaboration from aircraft designers, operators, air traffic uh, management personnel and uh, systems. I'm really excited about talking about that here. Thank you, Steve. And just for the audience, uh, we started already the first poll where I kindly ask you to rank the importance of the following uh, items, which the priorities, which are currently the priorities in aviation, environment, innovation, digitalization, ATM efficiency, frequency spectrum, and flight shaming. There is no order in that, but just give us your ranking of what you think is, uh, is most important. Okay, that's already on, and we will come back to those questions uh, later on. Philip, if I can ask you next, I mean, in your statement, what I liked most was we have to shift, and I quote you here, we have to shift from incremental to fundamental changes. That's what you said, and, 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 and you, were, you were focusing a lot on environmental uh, issues and their environmental targets, even if you, if you, if you debated on on innovation and digitalization, it was always linked to an environmental factor you had in. Why did this became the highest priority for you? Well, also from my side, Christian, um, I'm very happy to be here and, and particularly on such a, a distinguished uh, panel. Um, on your question, um, I think indeed what is really the difference between this decade and, and the previous decade is that we have to move from from incremental improvements to uh, more radical fundamental change. When we look at aviation in the past, a lot of progress was made. Uh, when you look at a, a per aircraft or per passenger performance, uh, we have uh, improved uh, on, on environmental criteria, definitely very much on noise, but also on emissions, mostly through better fuel efficiency. Um, uh, and aviation has, uh, other than that, contributed uh, also to uh, abatement in other sectors through uh, the European uh, emissions trading system, for example, so market-based measures. But what we've seen, uh, what is at the same time the, the success and the tragedy of our sector is that the growth has outpaced the fuel efficiency uh, improvements. And so in absolute terms, emissions from aviation continue to grow when in other sectors they are going down. So really the change that we need to make now is to, is to realize what we then, then would call in-sector emission reductions on, on a very uh, significant scale. Uh, and so, we, of course, we need to continue to improve fuel efficiency, and we know it's possible. Um, we need to continue to have market-based measures, uh, but we need, in addition, to exploit now uh, fully the opportunity of sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, we really need to uh, uh, improve the performance of our air navigation, uh, also to reduce uh, what are in fact avoidable e emissions. Uh, and we need to invest in new aircraft, new powertrains, uh, and in particular, uh, we're very excited about the prospect of, of hydrogen aircraft and, and various um, electric uh, options. So those, I think, are really the new, uh, the new kids on the block in this decade. And we will, uh, from, the, from the EU level and the European Commission, definitely be, be pushing those forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Philip. I, I, OK, I think it's clear and very consistent. But uh, Henry Kolla said yesterday that that's clear. Raphael, all of the speakers had more or less the same topics. We spoke about innovation, digitalization, eventually a little bit efficiency, ATM efficiency, modernization, single European sky. Uh, you also mentioned you made a very good statement saying we are used to challenges in aviation and we are used to address challenges in aviation. But you were the only one addressing saying there is also a financial issue at the moment. So Philip just said we have to invest in new aircrafts. I mean, we had a downtime now of a, more than a year not flying. Uh, can we afford all of that? Is that, I mean, good targets, but, but who is paying at the end? What, what, what's the airline's perspective? 
Well, uh, first of all, again, thank you, Christian, uh, to be able to be here in uh, in your this uh, virtual uh, panel with uh, my distinguished colleagues. Actually, uh, very important topic, uh, really, and and I I think um, I think we do all believe uh, uh, that the aviation has managed uh, very successfully to develop into uh, uh, you know a fantastic industry that has been innovative with new technology bringing uh, bringing new technology when when needed we are now facing an obviously uh, an unprecedented challenge right i mean uh, i believe in many of the things my colleague uh, already said in terms of uh, the need for innovation um, i believe also something that has brought aviation today and it was said i think before uh that the, the, this is a global industry so partnering and collaborating will be key this is this is uh, uh definitely important uh, i do believe definitely on the need for fundamental change that is clear otherwise with the deadlines that we have we're never going to be able to achieve this without some fundamentals uh being challenged now you touch on the financials and, and obviously uh we are living at this moment through the worst crisis aviation have, have uh, ever faced. Uh, our uh, numbers, as you have probably seen it before, shows that aviation has lost uh, in 2020, $126.4 billion, right? That's uh, the net loss last year. The expectation this year is for another $47.7 billion loss as well. By the way, the biggest part of it due to the current situation is in Europe, right? So high levels of uncertainty, which uh, it's, uh, uh, it's one of the uh, big concerns, I would say, not having certainty when this can start to um, reopen and, and start building back better, as we are saying lately. Now, the other thing we need to consider on the financials is, as you said, the ability to be able to do all this requires obviously the ability to be able to invest on this right i mean so we have massive investment that needs to be done the industry only in 2020 has increased 220 billion dollars in debt right so the increase is 220 billion as of december 2020 to around 651 billion dollars in debt so you can imagine the um, the situation obviously makes it even more challenging. So for us, uh, the, the critical thing is obviously to find the right incentives, I would say. Uh, we have always said that we should not look for, uh, uh, looking forward, we should not be looking at, let's say, uh, the more traditional means of how to tackle this, which is uh, probably raising taxes or, or, uh, or barriers, right, for growth, but instead investing uh, in research and development. And as, as, as it was said by my, my colleagues, we need innovation. We need new, uh, new aircraft uh, technology, new engine technology. Uh, we need massive, uh, 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 need massively to invest in sustainable aviation fuels if you're if you gonna get there. So very, very difficult, challenging times ahead. I believe we can do it, but there are definitely uh, major economic uh, barriers there as well as technological ones. Thanks a lot, Rafael. I mean, you made it clear and you had your numbers ready. Huh? So it's it, it's indeed, I mean, Henrik Hololai also mentioned we had crisis, we, we had different crises over the years, you know, but none of them were in this way. We have seen the last 14 months uh, and this downtime for such long. And we all have seen that how many airlines have left uh, business uh, and uh, in, in, in difficult situations right now. And if you fly over to an, uh, over an, air, an, an, an airport, uh, so I'm flying myself, you see it rather empty or it's a parking lot, uh, one of these two options, you know, but not too much traffic there, you are right. So just a quick reminder, the poll is open, two more minutes to go, uh, we leave it open. Uh, Give us your opinion in what uh, and rank the priorities in aviation. Uh, before I go to Luke, uh, Luke Ditkert, uh, so welcome, Luke. Uh, I think uh, EASA was quite 
I say in front of the curve. I mean, you you made a very good statement saying you are going more performance based regulation, and this performance based regulation will not only address safety, which is always the highest priority. It will have uh, uh, also security level, but you also said there will be a target now on environment as well in the future. So maybe you can explain a little bit how 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 EASA wants to address that. Is it part of the certification process or? or what is it exactly? Secondly, uh, you, you also mentioned, and, and I think that's also the transformation we see as EuroK as a standard developing organization, is that uh, the regulator and the standard developing organizations are working closer together because performance-based regulatory frame uh, gives a bit more flexibility, but needs a bit more uh, guidance material acceptable means of compliance, showing the how to comply with the regulatory frame, which is in a performance frame uh, framework is a bit more difficult to comply with. And we also saw that the oversight is not so easy. So this question to you, first, how do you address uh, the environmental issue? If you say, okay, it will not only be safety in the future, it will be environment as well. And secondly, uh, this, this, this performance-based uh, regulatory frame compared with, uh, with the partnership uh, you mentioned in your statement. Thank you, Christian, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you uh, uh, today to contribute to this uh, exchange of views on uh, what are the, the new challenges for, for aviation. Uh, Christian, on your first question, uh, yes, uh, as you know, uh, EASA since 2018 now has been asked by the EU legislator to engage into the environmental protection uh, area. Uh, we have that now. Uh, the competence was established already at the beginning, but it has been drastically reinforced. And uh, how we do that, uh, we have a, a tools kit uh, to, uh, to establish now. Um, it's first of all, uh, some of you know, uh, we are now producing every three years uh, reporting on the, the effort done by industry to, uh, to green themselves, being uh, uh, manufacturing industry, engine manufacturing industry, airlines, ENSPs, and so forth and so on. And this is uh, where it's sort of benchmarking. And we want to make use of this reporting, and we will publish a new report in 2022, spring, uh, to make recommendations and to show to society uh, what is the list of areas where we would like to recommend efforts to be done in order to green air, air transport and should cover all elements, all areas of aviation. Uh, not only uh, a lot has been done to reduce CO2 emission, <laughs> but I mean the environmental uh, community, NGOs, society are calling for a full life cycle assessment. And that's a major challenge to us. And we, we have to establish metrics, uh, comparison, and establish in a way, in an independent way, how the efforts are done in order to meet the Paris Agreement and the new challenge established by the EU 2030, 55% reduction. So we are now engaging into a, a labeling program. We have been asked by the Commission to start to see how we can label uh, uh, the flights, the, the, the airlines, uh, the airport, or even later on, uh, possibly the NSPs through a mechanism we have to agree together. And that would be a bit linked to the second question, the partnership we want to establish with them, but still. And this is an important message I want to leave here, uh, keeping the distance needed as we have to play as a regulator. Not to be seen as uh, promoting effort, but assessing effort and the results and confirming that we are on the right track. And we believe this is the only way to do it. And that is the way to, to go for a performance-based approach. On your second question, Christian, I think uh, this is uh, very important. We, are all, we all want to engage into innovation. And to go to do it uh, and to succeed, we see that the innovation is very much in hand of the non-classical industry actors. And they have another pace to develop their tools, their solutions. They want to be quickly on the market. So we at EASA, we want to, uh, to adapt to uh, this, this new commerce and to enable the new industry actors uh, to, uh, to be able to put on the market or to make available products which will have to be anyway pre-certified, certified, and have an, an early entry to market in order to help the conventional aviation industry, maybe to incorporate, to integrate those new solutions, which will have been seen by us as safe enough, 
secure enough and green enough. And that is probably the new agenda. Uh, we, we, are, we are leaving a bit the, the, the safety area to embrace the new elements. That can be done only through partnership and risk-based approach. And the way we want to engage, for example, on clean aviation, and the way we want to assess uh, how what is funded by the EU can match uh, the expectations, the political agreement today, uh, has to be done in, in collaboration with them because industry has to show us what they want to do. And we are, of course, equipped uh, by our own principal mechanism to accompany uh, the industry when they want to have uh, first feedback on what they do and not waiting that the product is finalized before entering into certification. This is a new type of relationship we are now establishing with, with industry. And it's the only way to, uh, to do it, we believe, not to delay, because I mean, the agenda, the 2050 agenda, is such an aggressive agenda for aviation that uh, reducing the time we are used to see uh, 10 years to get uh, HP80. Uh, for example, if we want to go and to uh, help hydrogen uh, to be deployed, uh, we, we, we know what exactly it means. And that requires a new methodology, a new method of working we are establishing. Thank you very much, Christian, for uh, the two questions. Thanks a lot, Luke. And, and indeed, you mentioned also the newcomers in aviation. That's, that's indeed a factor we have seen also at the Euro K level that uh, it needs a different way of working. Uh, it, uh, we are using different languages and uh, we need to accommodate that. And we also see that we need to adapt our processes and procedures on that. And we are, especially with the ASA and the regulatory frame, we are mixing here also uh, the processes uh, between the market base or the market uh, uh, the products on the market, CE marking and so on. And also the conventional, uh, the conventional uh, aviation side uh, and the certification world on aviation, which is very well developed, um, we must say. I mean, we have uh, a lot of experience in that. Okay, thank you very much for your answers for the ranking. I think we can we can share the result of our uh, first uh, poll. Then don't forget to to post your other questions at the at the audience uh, Q and A section. So it's clearly the ranking environment, uh, not a surprise. That's what you all said. Uh, environment is, is the highest priority, followed by innovation. I think that can go hand in hand uh, sometimes, but also uh, I think that has also uh, a valid issue, something uh, Steve mentioned in several other areas, CNS, uh, uh, you said in your, in, in your recorded statement as well, uh, followed by digitalization, ATM efficiency, and then on the frequency spectrum and flight chaining. So really no surprise on that. And let me, with this result, open the second poll, because the second poll then asks us what we think is in, in terms of environmental measures, rank the following element by the order of importance. And important mean, means how mature is it that we have it, but also how effective will it be to reduce our CO2 footprint in aviation. So let the audience uh, uh, again give us their opinion while we uh, have a first look at the questions we are having. Flight efficiency depends not only on technology, but also very much on an optimum flight profile, something currently hindered by the fragmentation in Europe compared to the US. What will be done at the political level to push the single European sky? Philippe, I don't think I have anyone better than you to answer this question. Yes, um, we, we still have in Europe, uh, as before, even though uh, you wouldn't say so today, um, the most congested airspace um, when you look at, at the continental scale, um, and also the most uh, fragmented one with a large uh, number of small uh, players. And even within some of the NSPs, we, we then have separate uh, operators inside, separate centers. Um, and we, we know this for decades. Um, somehow we haven't yet been able to get our head around this and, and address this uh, effectively. Uh, we are uh, giving it another try with uh, our latest proposal um, uh, to reform the general framework for uh, the single European sky. And, uh, known as a CES2 plus proposal, which is currently going through council and parliament 
um, and hopefully will be adopted uh, in the next uh, year or so. Uh, and this really um, for us has to create an environment where we are able to address uh, the European challenges in a more effective way than, than before. Um, uh, and, and this can only be done by, by, by digitalizing more, uh, by stimulating cooperation across borders, by stimulating interoperability that we are still not seeing enough uh, in Europe. Um, and um, I think it goes very well with when you look at the technology side uh, with uh, what, uh, what Luke was, was talking about um, in terms of performance-based approach um, that, that actually creates space for new uh, procedures and products uh, in a way that we, we cannot do if we have a prescriptive approach because we're always running behind. Um, and that's where um, the, the closer cooperation between the EASAs of this world and the Eurokais of this world is something that we have been pushing. Uh, and I think it's, it's happening now uh, to give also uh, standards a bigger place in that performance-based uh, regulatory environment. That's really a, a precondition uh, to address the, the fragmentation problem in Europe. And then of course, we need to create the incentives for all the players to be motivated uh, to, to move forward in that direction. And, and here we, we still have some challenges as well um, in Europe to motivate everybody, get everybody together uh, to do that. Uh, we try to do that uh, through um, systems or, or joint actions like the CESAR um, a program and joint undertaking. Uh, which is working very well. We want to continue it um, with a strong involvement of Eurokai and the EASA to make sure that what is developed there is also deployable. Um, but we need an extra effort on the implementation and the deployment side. Um, there is clearly not a lot of money in the sector, as was mentioned before. Um, we will be facing a lot of debt service in the coming years, but not all the innovations have to cost a lot of money. Often it's also a question of focus and of will uh, to implement them. Thank you. Thanks, and, and if you allow, I'll, I come later on back to that, and maybe Luke can 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 answer and can jump in again on this performance-based, risk-based, and the newcomers. I think that, that that's really a paradigm shift in in, in, in certification as well. But uh, Rafael, for the for the airlines, is it is it really only a uh, a European problem that we have borders and don't have a seamless uh, operation. I mean, that is that not uh, somewhere else in, in in other regions? Well, <clears throat> yes, um, Chris, I I think <clears throat> sorry, apologies. Um, well, one of the main um, I guess pillars that we we looked at in the in the um, uh, let's say the blueprint for these green. Uh, recovery, if you would, or you know, the green uh, approach to aviation is actually improvements in operations and infrastructures. I think we have re we have touched on it in different ways uh, just now, right? And and Philip was very clear about uh, uh, the the initiative to reform uh, CES2 Plus, for example. Um, these are already, uh, let's say, areas like the CES2 Plus, but not only. You refer to the world. Uh, also in other places around the world where this is, this is something we already have the technology, we already have the capability, and we are still lagging behind in implementing them, right? So I think uh, uh, these points that were raised, also the ones raised by, by Luke in, in terms of uh, performance base, um, um, and all of, all of these activities are very much needed to drive, uh, let's say, operational efficiencies with existing technology, right? And we were not, this is a much, much needed uh, effort where if uh, non, the other technologies are not there yet. So if we are gonna get there, in the meantime, we need to implement them, the, the single European sky, well, the CES2+, uh, the Swiss and John undertaking as well. I mean, all of those things need to move forward, I would say faster uh, uh, and more decisively. Right. I mean, we talked about um, cross border. I think Philip mentioned about the cross border collaboration and, and efficiencies and digitalization. All of these things are things that we can do today. And we have not necessarily proven that we are actually doing it fast enough, considering the emergency 
And we do talk about, and we see a lot of investments about obviously and initiatives to develop, uh, you know, sustainable aviation fuel projects, um, you know, hybrid aircraft, electric aircraft. So I think this is a very, very critical area. I mean, the CES2 Plus for me is the closest example uh, today for us here in Europe, but it's not the only one. There are many, many areas around the world where we can drive even more airport efficiencies, um, operational efficiencies, uh, et cetera. So yeah, this is, this is one of the critical elements until we are able to get the right uh, and adequate technology to be able to um, drive a more sustainable industry. Okay, thank you, Rafael. We have a question here, even if it just came on, but it's, it's reflecting very nicely on, on the poll we had. Innovation is on the top of the priority for poll one. We need fundamental changes. That's what, what we heard already. Great thoughts, bluntly. Who is going to pay for that? Uh, it's hard to fund, uh, to fund high risk uh, R&D, which is not profitable. Even Cesar is pushing TRL, TR, TRLs up, uh, which is uh, determinal and, and fundamental changes. What, what are we doing about that? I mean, uh, okay, a question. We have now that it's high, high priority on our list uh, environment. We know that it costs, uh, we spoke about that we eventually have to change our fleet, modernize our fleet, and we, we are coming to that. Um, there is a lot of investment. Where, where is, this, is this coming from? I know, uh, Steve, what, what, is it on a global level the same? Uh, you see that on, on, on ICAO level? Or, or do you need to see how you focus here? Because you mentioned clearly you, 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 you need to find the right balance for that. Because sometimes you have a different priority of connectivity and, and, and so on. So, so do you see that on, on, on a global level? Absolutely, but not achieved at a global level, achieved at a local level and integrating into a global outcome. So when I listen to, to all of this um, and, you know, we, when we talk about ATM and, and aviation efficiency, it, it becomes incredibly complex immediately because of the issues that Luke described, the conversation around keeping things safe. And that's all to, ultimately the bottom line. You can have the most efficient system in the world if people are not confident that they can go through the airport turnstile and get on the airplane with an absolute feeling of comfort for their safety, they won't do it. So I think that the, the challenge we have is, is integrating all of this innovation in a safety management and safety risk assessment system that is effective. That's step one. And I think IASA is one of the, the game changers in how we're approaching that. The second piece, which we talked about with the single European sky, is the idea that um, some of these aviation jobs, much to, my, to the chagrin of my uh, colleagues at IATA, are uh, the good paying jobs in ATM. And ATM jobs, uh, we like them local. We like them right under the airspace where we're controlling. And that's not because it's more efficient. It's because that's where the good paying jobs need to be, quote unquote. So we have to find a way for those good paying jobs to stay exactly where they are, or perhaps even move them around socially, but to do it in a way where we can efficiently apply those skills and capabilities into the airspace where they are needed. And I'll break a little China here and say there's no room for industrial interruptions in a modern ATM world. There should be a capability for ATM systems to dynamically compete for effectiveness in a world that is trying to achieve environmental sustainability and zero emissions footprint. So if you take that and make it your top imperative, then you have to find a way to resolve the industrial problem. Now, the way to do that is to address those working issues that those people wanna hear are addressed. And I think that's one of the places where you're okay is especially well suited because the very top benefit out of all of them that an air traffic professional wants to enjoy is a system that works. One where they can do their job effectively day in and day out with competent delivery of the technical capabilities. So they need to be well-designed, well-specified, well-tested, integrated in a way that 
is rapidly evolving so that we can keep up with the rest of the world. Your smartphone evolves, your cars evolve, airplanes are evolving very quickly. Christian, you probably got some of the latest stuff in your airplane. Can you connect it to anything in the ATM world without you dialing a knob and talking? That's what we need. If I was going to pick something out that you want to challenge the European system to, I got the air rack cycle date out. And I looked to see where we could go. And I, I picked Christmas. Christmas 2025 is the air rack cycle that you should be able to achieve dynamic resectorization across an FIR national boundary in the first instance and give them an incentive for doing it. And by the last air rack cycle in 2030, it ought to be mandatory. That's a combination of incentives combined with ultimately penalties for the ones who are late bloomers. That's just taking care of the ATM piece. Pick out another moonshot goal for propulsion to get somebody into more efficient propulsion. Tie metrics for the emissions to all of these activities, place them on the front side and make us solve problems to get to those dynamics on all four of Philippe's pillars. Do that in a way that is subsidized effectively on the front end and on the back end, you're a market loser if you haven't gotten done. That way, IATA has the benefit of an integrated system with the airports. I think it's a challenge that all of us have to do all over the world. And at ICAO, we do our part to make sure that we keep up so that the innovations can be globally applied from the uh, leaders who are developing them and approving them safely like IASA would do because they'd be your partner all through the system. Let's do it that way. Steve, you mentioned I have uh, the modern technology in my aircraft. Uh, that's true when I look at my GNSS uh, receiver with an SPAS and I can fly an LPV approach, but I'm also carrying an ADF and I also I still speak on a VHF com. So we are very good in having additional innovative solutions in addition, but we are not very good in replacing all technology with a new technology, which would be available. I think here we have a really shortcoming and that's difficult because we need to switch overnight. And that makes it really difficult on that. But before I want to ask Philip, because it was a, a question a little bit on the, uh, uh, how we fund that all. And I think there is a political dimension on, on environment. Let me share the result of the poll number two and what we think or what the audience think are the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, elements and the, the, the most important uh, measures we can take uh, in order to address uh, uh, environment. So if we can get that on the screen. So first of all, sustainable fuel. Second, hydrogen propulsion, more efficient ATM procedures, hybrid propulsion and electric propulsion is, 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 is on the lower side. So Philippe, if there is a, a political dimension in a, in, a, in a direction, you have some tools and the tools normally are financial tools. So, so how are you promoting these environmental targets, which is the highest on the list? and how you make sure that it's a success at the end, because that was actually the question uh, uh, which was raised. Is that successful and, and who will finance that? Well, thanks, Christian. First, I just want to say that I really agree with everything Steve just said. Um, it was a very good description of the, the challenges we have in Europe and, and the solutions that are out there for all of us together to grab. Um, and um, if Steve can, get as a way to motivate everybody to grab them, we'll hire him. But I, I know he doesn't need a job, so maybe, maybe we'll, um, we'll have to uh, talk about that over, over a beer once we're allowed to do that. Um, but he, and I just wanted to pick up one of the many points he made, which is that we, we need to also engage with the people in the, in the sector uh, to have a discussion with them on what it means uh, for them uh, to digitalize and modernize the systems. Um, and when we do that, we see there's actually a lot of interest and openness in that, um, particularly from the young people who come into the sector, but also from the, the older people. Um, but we need to have that conversation and, and see how it affects their work and their livelihoods um, to come to, a, to a, a common understanding of where we're going. That's really important and something we need to do more of uh, also, also in Europe. 
But on your question, um, well, first on the poll, I wanted to react. Uh, what is interesting is that there's not a single winner. And it seems also the audience agrees that all of these things need to be done uh, in parallel. That's also our, our view. And, and we're trying to put some um, European uh, taxpayer money uh, also in the right uh, areas here. Uh, I just want to mention um, Cesar and uh, both the research and the deployment where we will try in the future to focus our uh, spending more on uh, the most promising solutions, um, putting more uh, money into supporting demonstration projects and helping um, de-risk the, the early movers um, or the first movers, uh, as well as uh, helping those who have a negative business case for themselves um, and support them um, on, on projects and technologies that are good for the overall system, but that are costing them on a net basis extra money. So we need to really focus our, our investments a, a bit more than, than we have in the past. We still have very considerable budgets of the same order of magnitude as before uh, in the area of, of CESAR, uh, both research and deployment. Um, and we are also um, renewing uh, the uh, joint undertaking to develop new aircraft, the clean aviation uh, joint undertaking with uh, almost 2 billion uh, euros over the coming years. Uh, and with a huge commitment from the industry, uh, which is actually bigger uh, than the, the public money that we are uh, going to put in to uh, build those new aircraft and new powertrains that we will need in the future. So we're really trying to um, put our money where our mouth is and, and find ways of investing in the, the most promising areas um, and, uh, and those that will contribute most to the environmental goals. Um, in that sense, indeed, some measures are more effective than others, and um, we are going to place burdens on the industry, and probably passengers will need to pay a bit more in the future, for example, for the, the sustainable fuels. Uh, and perhaps it's better to put the, the burden on those areas that actually bring emissions uh, down, uh, rather than just uh, increasing the cost uh, of flying uh, through taxation. And there, I, I must say, I, I do have some personal sympathy, at least for what Raphael was saying earlier on. Back to you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And we are already out of time, but I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to, to come back to look for a very short answer. But I see already this is a perfect circle to, to, to go ahead and discuss this topic. So maybe we have a second round on that if you if you allow to invite you once more and have another webinar to discuss on that. Because we had already in our pre-meeting we wanted to have a 30 minute debate and then we ended up more than an hour debating on the different topics. So Rafael, Steve, uh, Philip and Luke, eventually we are coming back. Look, just one very short question, very short question and a very short answer on that. All those newcomers, they're coming already in with a different uh, a technology and propulsion system. Is the regulatory frame ready for that? Is the certification process ready for that? Thank you, Christian. Yes, I will be as short as possible on this. And so, yes, I think we, we have a good test case now. When we refer to newcomers, let's maybe limit ourselves to uh, what we see coming immediately now, the, the drones, uh, the single pilot operation or uh, urban air mobility. Uh, the, 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 what your question is, in fact, is an objective. <laughs> we have to be ready. It's what I was saying before. If the regulator is not capable to follow up the, the pace of evolution of this technology, we will really kill uh, all innovation. And that is where I mean, we are prepared. When it is needed, the regulatory framework, the ASA has been asked to, to run on behalf of the EU, is enabling this flexibility and to uh, approve through special conditions some operations, some, uh, some uh, provisions of services. This is possible. Yes, we are ready. It's a question of getting the right information from industry, what they need. And I'm back to my uh, famous uh, statement. I mean, the partnership with industry is important. We must be working together on that. Back to you now. And of course, Christian, more than happy with the colleagues to come back to you for a second round of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raphael, Steve, Philip, and Luke. Uh, Steve, sorry for getting you out of the bed so early. It's five o'clock. It was five o'clock in the morning when we got in touch today. So thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks a lot for your contribution today. 
I think we have a five minute break now before we then go to the panel, the panel number three, where you paved the way already in the direction environment and how the industry, and here we have a lot of industry members participating uh, in, in panel three. So let's see what, uh, what, what, what solutions are, uh, are ready and how far they are and what the challenges are at this day uh, today. Uh, with this, I, I give back for a short five minute break and uh, we put these five minutes I lost here at the end of the day. So thank you very much and uh, stay tuned. So we will come back uh, with this panel again uh, for a round number two. And I think we keep the question uh, which were raised today and, and bring them up uh, next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Set standards that define communication and information solutions for safety critical environments, reliability and performance in control centers when it matters most. Notruf Feuerwehrrettungsdienst. Ja, wenn Sie bewusstlos wird, rufen Sie nochmal die Flughafen Feuerwehr der Notruf. Frequentis is the global market leader in voice communication systems. Request information on track number Alpha Alpha 010. As a technology driver, we provide solutions for traffic growth and capacity challenges at times when airspace users are changing. Performance is measured in seconds when lives and livelihoods are on the line. Police forces, first responders, public transport dispatchers, maritime operators, as well as search and rescue coordinators rely on Frequentis technology to keep us safe at all times. Safe transportation of people and goods is needed locally and around the world. Our focus on research and development is based on a deep commitment to innovation. We shape the way technology develops actively. We focus on technologies that impact our future and find the winning approach. We apply latest technology, which builds on improved data exchange and collaboration, enabling visionary concepts of operation. Our products and our people operate globally. Locations on all continents and close cooperation with our customers give us a solid understanding of regional needs. We shape standards together with clients and global institutions. We are Frequentis, 1,900 employees globally with safety critical DNA as well as passion and experience. We will continue to keep 3 billion passengers safe every year. We are Frequentis, and our commitment is a safer world. Music